Hello and welcome. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for OneOp. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to today's session on estate planning for military families. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides we're sharing. If you can't see them or have any other technical difficulties today, you can send us a tech support request via email at contact at oneop.org. I'll put this email address in the chat pod momentarily for your convenience. As many of you have already done, we do look forward to having you join us in the chat pod today for conversation, questions. Also, if you'd like to let us know where you're joining us from, we'd love to hear from you. To embed the chat so you don't miss any links or conversation, simply place your cursor over the shared slide you should then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen, <clears throat> excuse me, and then from there you can select the chat bubble icon. When typing your comments and questions, please be sure to select everyone from the response options drop down menu. This just ensures everyone who's on today's webinar can see those as they come through the chat pod. Note that the slides for today are available for download on the event page. We'll place that link in the chat as well in just a second. Uh, also, we'll be covering evaluation and continued education information at the end of today's webinar, especially if you are interested in continued education opportunities or a certificate, certificate of, uh, pardon me, or a certificate of attendance, uh, do stay tuned for that information. We're pleased to introduce you to our new name, OneUp. We thank you for joining us as we continue our partnership with the Department of Defense and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to expand readiness, knowledge, and networks of the professionals supporting our military service members and their families. This time, it's my pleasure to turn things over to my colleague, Selena Garrison. She's a program coordinator with the OneUp personal finance team, and she'll be introducing our presenter today. Selena? Good morning. Thank you, Coral. Thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. Today, we're joined by Ms. Mary Benzinger. Ms. Benzinger has served as the Senior Legal Assistance Attorney for the U.S. Army at the Pentagon Joint Legal Assistance Office since 2009. She has advised service members, retirees, and their families on estate planning matters for more than 15 years and is a graduate of Georgetown University, Washington, D.C., and received her Juris Doctor from the Washington College of Law, the American University in Washington, D.C. She's been a member of the Virginia State Bar since 1987. Before coming to the Army, she was in private practice in Northern Virginia for 19 years. Ms. Benzinger is a frequent lecturer on many legal issues of concern to service members, including family law, family support and custody and estate planning, and a guest lecturer at the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General's Legal Center in school. At this time, I am excited to turn things over to Ms. Mary Benzinger. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm not sure if I have slide control yet. Let me see. I do. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. As said, uh, I'm Mary Benzinger. I'm the uh, legal assistance attorney for the Army here in the Pentagon. I've been here about almost coming up on 16 years in September. Time flies. Um, I have done this presentation with you all before, and so thank you for having me back. I really appreciate it. Uh, with that, let's get started. If you have questions during this presentation, uh, please feel free to pop them in the chat. We'll try to respond to them as as they pop, uh, and uh, we will also answer some questions at the end if you just want to hold them till then. It's completely up to you. I'm, I'm flexible on this. Okay, so uh, a typical disclaimer applies. The opinions expressed here are my own. They are not the Department of the Army or the Department of Defenses, and it's not intended as a substitute for legal tax advice. This is basically to give you an awareness of some estate planning issues that you may see some of the people uh, in front of you come up with, uh, give you some awareness, give you some things to look out for. Uh, and, and I'm talking largely in generalities. I'll talk about a couple states just to give you some examples, but it really varies greatly by state. So you need to be aware that things may be different where you live than some of the things we talk about today. But once again, we're trying to give you some awareness of some issues. So let's get started. Okay, uh, what I'd like to do for you guys today is to familiarize you with some estate planning tools and techniques so you understand how all this stuff works together. Uh, a lot of people just think, oh, I've done a will or I've done a power of attorney, you'll take care of everything. Uh, it's actually much more complicated than that. And we'll talk about how all these things work together. 
um, and also to get you thinking about individual situations and goals, uh, what some of the things your your clients may face, some of the things you personally may face, uh, to kind of get you thinking about, hey, wait a minute, I have that situation, maybe I need to uh, think think about my position on this, uh, and and we'll talk about it. Some of the little myths that people think are true that aren't, uh, and uh, dispel some of those. Okay, so what is estate planning? Um, it's really a, a, a complex process in, in a way. Comprehensive is probably a better word, uh, but it's also a continuing process for arranging for the use, conservation, and transfer of your property wealth during your life and upon your death. And the magic word is continuing. Uh, again, this is not just drop a will, walk away for 40 years. Um, I actually had a fellow come in one time with a will written in Vietnam on a piece of paper that we used to call onion skin. I, some of you may not be old enough to remember that kind of typing paper, but it was pretty darn old. Uh, don't do that. Uh, this is a continuous process. So every time you have a new kid or you buy a new house or uh, you acquire a new life partner or lose a life partner, uh, it's time to rethink your position. Uh, and so these are things you should be thinking about all the time. Okay, some of the common techniques that, that, that are available for estate planning is the ever popular do nothing. Uh, doing nothing is usually not a really good idea. Uh, lots of people say, well, you know, I'll just let my, my family figure this out or the court figure this out. Well, there is no bigger mess than this. And we'll talk about probate and why probate is a problem and a hassle. But doing absolutely nothing really is um, a kind of uncool and, and, and really a cruel thing to do to your family, I think. Uh, we'll talk about, about ownership, joint ownership, and how joint ownership works and why it's important. We'll also talk about things like beneficiary transfers, transfers on death, and of course, we'll talk about wills and trusts, okay? So what are the, some of the goals that, that people think about when they're estate planning? Uh, uh, taking care of my family. Uh, I, I have college age kids, I have minors, uh, maybe I have adult children and now grandchildren. Am I in a blended family? There are particular issues with blended families and we'll talk about some of those. Uh, and some of the basics are, you know, bequests. Uh, who's gonna get your property? Who's gonna, who do you wanna leave your stuff to? Uh, and sometimes those are simple decisions and sometimes those can be very complex. Uh, as part of your estate plan, you're going to appoint fiduciaries. And, and people are like, oh, what's a fiduciary? Um, well, uh, the, the easy way to remember what a fiduciary is, is you know, those old 1930s movies where uh, every dog was named Fido. Well, your fiduciaries are your Fidos. They, they are your loyal, faithful, trustworthy uh, from the Latin word. And uh, they are going to stand in your shoes and do something for you. Uh, the the uh, agent on a power of attorney is a fiduciary. Guardians for your children are fiduciaries. Uh, personal representatives, executors of your or will are fiduciaries, trustees. Sometimes even your lawyers could be your fiduciaries. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So these are important uh, folks who are going to, you're going to trust to handle things for you once you're gone. Uh, and maybe while you're still alive, depending on, you know, for power of attorney agents. Uh, disability, incapacity, end of life planning, we'll talk about some of those. Things like um, durable powers of attorney, advanced medical directives, living wills, that, that sort of thing. Remember I said don't just drop a will and walk away? Well, all these things you see on this slide comprise a proper estate plan and the things I look at when I'm talking to a client and preparing an estate plan. Uh, it could be any of these things. We could be retitling assets. We're looking at transfer on deaths and pay on death and deaths and beneficiary designations on IRAs and thrift savings plans, life insurance. Uh, is there a trust required in, in terms of, you know, maybe there, we'll talk a little bit about living trust. We don't do those in legal assistance, but we do tell people about them. Uh, trust for minors in testamentary trusts also. Uh, obviously wills and the healthcare powers of attorney, end of life instructions. Um, and some, we won't talk much about anatomical gift designations, but these are all part of, part and parcel of uh, a, a comprehensive estate plan. So as you can see, dropping a will is not good enough. All these things have to be thought about, all right? Okay, so what happens if you do absolutely nothing? 
Um, you don't have beneficiary designations. You don't jointly title anything. Well, you pretty much guarantee that when you die, all your assets are going through probate. And we'll talk about probate in, in a little bit more detail in a minute. Uh, your assets will also be distributed under something called an intestacy law. Every state has one. It is uh, the default distribution of your assets should you die without a will. Uh, and those vary wildly by state. Um, people say to me all the time, well, you know, my, my, my spouse gets everything when I die, right? Not necessarily. Uh, some states have extremely interesting in, in, intestacy laws. Um, I don't know whether it's still true or not, but Massachusetts had something like your spouse gets like 13,000 bucks and then your kids get the rest. Um, and or I think Maryland is uh, uh, your spouse gets uh, your, your surviving parent gets X amount of dollars and then your spouse gets the rest. So some of these intestacy laws can be pretty interesting in terms of how they think your estate should go, depending on who survives you. And it may not be what you want. So relying on the intestacy laws uh, it can be dangerous. It may guarantee you don't get what you want. If you become incapacitated and you haven't done any kind of planning at all, you haven't signed any advanced medical directives or anything like that, um, you're going to wind up with someone having to go to court to um, control your assets. Uh, that, that's just how that's going to work because there there is an estate I can think of that has a uh, a statutory power of attorney for finances person. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, someone has to go to court and do this. Uh, this is always a hassle. If you die and leave minor children behind, uh, a court's going to pick a guardian for your kids. Uh, that may not be who you want, uh, but you're going to be gone and you're not going to get to say. So these are just a few of the issues that go wrong when you do absolutely nothing. Um, the nothing default is 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 almost guaranteed you're not going to get what you want. Okay, so let's let's talk about what your estate is for starters. Uh, there's a, a couple things that, that you should know. Uh, you'll hear people throw around the word gross estate. Um, if you're talking about in the context of especially gross estate for tax purposes, uh, it's going to be everything you own and things you never thought of. So for tax purposes, uh, your house, your cars, your real estate, bank accounts, investments, IRAs, 401ks, you know, insurance, personal belongings, and the present value of any survivor benefit plan you or your client may have. Uh, when the tax cap, is, the federal tax cap was like a million dollars, this was a real problem because a lot of people had more than a million dollars worth of life insurance. And then when you threw on the present value of the survivor benefit plan to the spouse, they were way over the number. And that complicated things a great deal. Uh, now, there's a slide I think in here somewhere. Now it's 11.6 million a piece. Most folks don't have that problem. Uh, it's a great problem to have. Uh, but most folks don't have the $11.6 million, uh, can't beat that threshold. So, uh, but still you should know what, what a gross estate is because there are some states that still have estate taxes uh, that are significantly lower than the federal. So uh, good things to know. But the two things we're going to talk a lot about are probate asset, uh, probate estate and non-probate estate. Uh, these are some of the linchpins of planning that you should know about. Um, a, a probate estate or probate assets uh, are everything you own that's going to pass to someone else through the will. And we're going to talk about this more specifically in a second. Uh, Non-probate assets uh, in a state is everything that passes to others outside of your will. Okay, so that sounds confusing. But we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Let's talk about probate first. So so what what is probate? Um, all right, so I die. Uh, my brother's my executor. He's going to take my will down to the courthouse. And I guarantee you there's a little old lady with glasses on a chain behind a counter, and she is going to prove my will, hence the word probate. Okay, she's going to prove my will. And how do you prove a will? Uh, well, typically they look at the back page to see if everybody has signed this to make sure that the uh, 
the testator has signed it, the person who wrote the will, and to make sure that the right number of witnesses are, are there because states have requirements on the number of witnesses that must sign the will uh, with, with the testator, whether or not it's notarized, whether or not it has something called a self-proving affidavit, hence the word prove again, um, because one of the things that has to happen is the right number of people have to be in the room together, all watching each other sign, uh, and the self-proving affidavit validates that. So this is, this is how they validate the will, all right? Uh, and once my brother does this uh, and, and the clerk has decided that it's a properly executed will, the clerk is going to open up an administrative court proceeding called probate. Uh, that's going to trigger some duties in my brother. Uh, he's going to have to now notify all my heirs. He's going to have to notify all my creditors. You know those little skinny ads in the back of the newspaper? Well, he's going to be taking a bunch of those out, uh, trying to let people know that I'm gone. Um, so what happens then? Well, now he's going to have to um, inform the court what's going on. What are my assets? Where are they? Is he going to liquidate them and put them in a bank account? Is he going to um, uh, sell them? Is he going to keep them? Is you know, can he find them all? So he's going to have to do accountings and inventories and then more accountings and more inventories, and then he's going to have to make sure my income taxes are paid because uh, you still owe personal income taxes even after you're dead on the income you earn before you died for that year because you know the IRS doesn't give anybody a break on anything so you're going to be paying taxes on whatever your income was the year earned the year before you during the year you died so there's a lot of work in this everybody hates it I've never heard anyone say gee I love probate uh, because they don't uh, and at the end of the rainbow after my brother has done all this heavy lifting uh, the court is going to say, okay, uh, now you may distribute the assets in accordance with the will, or uh, if there's no will, uh, intestacy. Okay. And then once those checks are cut, uh, they're going to close the estate. But that's probate. It's a lot of work. People like to avoid probate. Hence, there are things called probate avoidance techniques. And we're going to talk about this. Okay. One of the things I do when I have uh, interview clients is make them list out their assets for me. And it's not because I'm being nosy. I'm looking for two things. One, I'm looking for value to make sure they're not over 11.6 million because it does happen. Uh, and the other thing is I want to look at these assets to figure out whether they're probate assets going through the court process or non-probate assets not having to go through the court process. So, so, so when I'm when I'm looking at these assets, how do I how do I know? I mean, it doesn't like jump off the page. They don't tell you, uh, I'm a probate asset. I'm a non-probate asset, right? So, uh, I tell my clients this is a very simple test. For each asset you have on your list, ask yourself, is this asset an orphan when I die? So, if I own a house in my own name, uh, and I die. Once I'm dead, my house no longer has a human owner. It's an orphan, right? If it's an orphan, it's going through probate. It's just that simple. Uh, the same would hold true for bank accounts. In my name only, I die. Um, it's an orphan. It's going through probate. It can only be distributed through the probate court. So the kinds of things that are almost surefire guarantees to be probate or anything solely titled, titled in my name only. Uh, be careful of, count, of accounts that are just joint. They look like they might be uh, non-probate, but they may not be. It depends on what state you're in. This typically comes up in the context of, uh, you know, my 80-year-old mom said, you know, maybe I ought to put you on my account just in case you need to write checks. And she went down to the bank and they put me on the account. And it was technically a joint account, but it, what it really was, was an accommodation account, which meant I could write checks for her and make deposits, but that money wasn't mine at her death. Uh, it was gonna stay hers. So it was still a probate asset. So be careful of those little joint accounts like that. They're not what you think they are necessarily. Uh, anything titled tenants in common, uh, you'll see tenants in common sometimes on a bank account, uh, a lot of times on property, real property. And you'll see that in the context of 
uh, if my if my brother and I buy a condominium together, a vacation home together, uh, we are likely on the deed to be tenants in common. Tenants in common means we each own a divisible share to be divided someday by a court if we haven't already done it by an agreement, but to be divided uh, in, in each of our names. And those individual shares of a tenants in common property are orphans when you die. So your share of that piece of vacation property is going through probate. A lot of folks don't realize that. They think that their brother's just gonna get it at their death. That will not be so if it's tenants in common. Okay, things that are more likely non-probate. There are some guaranteed ones of those. Uh, anything joint with writer survivorship. Okay, so uh, uh, if my brother and I decided to buy our vacation property joint with writer survivorship, uh, that means the last man standing gets to keep it. So if I die, it is he has a right of survivorship in that property, which means he gets my piece. All right? And so that's automatic because of the titling. And you'll see joint with right of survivorship on bank accounts. You'll you'll you, some, you might even get a bank account in 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 your mail at home uh, that says you know Mary Benzinger J T W R O S next to my name, and you're like, well, what's J T W? Joint title with right of survivorship. That's what JTWROS is. Uh, and so that means I own it with somebody else who's going to get it when I die. Uh, anything tenants by the entirety or tenants by the entirety, you'll see it both ways. Um, uh, I think it's 26 states have, have the concept of tenants by the entireties. That is for spouses only. Um, it typically has a survivorship component. So if you read a tenants by the entirety's deed, it will usually say tenants by the entirety with common law right of survivorship, which means again, the last man standing survives. So if my spouse and I own a house together, tenants by the entireties with common law right of survivorship and I die, the whole property is automatically hers at my death, okay? Uh, or any alternative, she dies, uh, the property is automatically mine at, at her death. Uh, very common um, around here. Uh, Virginia has it, Maryland has it, but West Virginia does not. So you have to pay attention to what state you're in uh, and, and whether you have this, this or not. The other thing that tenants by the entireties does for you is it's creditor protection. It has this interesting kind of legal fiction, uh, a concept that my spouse and I each own 100% of the property. So if my spouse gets in any kind of financial trouble and somebody tries to come after the property, they can't. Uh, it's tenants by the entireties. I own 100% of the house and she owns 100% of the house uh, is, is the easiest way to think about it. It, it just means that that property is pretty much uh, judgment proof. Uh, you're not gonna be able to sell the house out from underneath us because I own 100% of it and she owns 100%. Um, there are things it's called pay on deaths and transfer on deaths. Uh, you will see those in the context of um, uh, bank accounts often. Um, so I have a little checking account down at uh, uh, Navy Federal Credit Union and it's in my name only. If I die, that's going through probate. I don't want that. Uh, I'd like my sister to have my bank account. I don't really want to put my sister on my bank account uh, because I don't want her sniffing around in there. Um, so what do I do? Uh, I go down to Navy Federal Credit Union and ask them for a transfer on death or a pay on death, depends what state you're in. And they're going to give me a little form to fill out. And I'm going to fill it out and say, you know, at my death, please pay my sister, Betty. And when I do that, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. And they're not permanent. They're revocable. Uh, you can you can change them anytime you want to. And so if I die, someone sends Navy Federal Credit Union my death certificate and Navy Federal Credit Union is going to pull up my account and they're going to send Betty a very polite letter that says, we're sorry for your loss. Where would you like us to send the money? And they do all that outside of um, probate. Kind of neat. Okay. Hey Mary, we've had a couple of questions come in. Yep. Lorraine is uh, okay. So let's see. Um, it says uh, Florida also has tenants by the entirety uh, preferred, but fewer than half the states have them. It's, I think it's about 26 states, maybe, or 21 states. I can't remember off the top of my head on the T by E. Uh, is that the same as a Totten Trust? Uh, yes, pretty much. Uh, the beneficiary designations. Um, 
And if you own property in different states, is there a probate in each state? Yes, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about uh, some, some of the perils of, of owning things in many different states and how to solve that problem. Uh, okay, thanks for the questions, gang. Um, so uh, uh, pay on death, transfer on death are almost always non-probate. There are some exceptions to that rule. Some states have something they call a clawback. So if I'm a Virginia resident and I die and I have transfer on deaths on all my accounts and my sister gets all the money, but I've left a, a, a ton of debt behind, uh, they may be able to, to pull those accounts back into probate. It doesn't happen very often, but it can. So that's not necessarily a guaranteed thing. I haven't really seen anybody have a clawback problem in a long, long time. Um, so, um, that's a pay on death, transfer on death with, with the little caveats. Uh, beneficiary designations on things like life insurance. Uh, I leave my um, SGLI to my sister Betty. Uh, I die, somebody sends SGLI a death certificate and SGLI sends her the polite letter with a check attached. Uh, and that's all outside of probate. Uh, and inter vivos trust property, the living trust, we'll talk more about trusts in a second but those uh, living trust uh, assets are going to be on the non-probate side, okay? Uh, let's see, it's a little slow, hold on. There we go, okay. So, oops, yeah, I'm having, it's a little slow, sorry guys. Uh, this is a Virginia example. There are a bunch of states and I'll give you a list of states that have things. Um, some states have transfers on death for motor vehicles, right? They vary a great deal, but that's something to keep in mind, especially when you have military people uh, who uh, usually and, and very typically only title things in their own name uh, or people who are single um, title a motor vehicle in their own name. Some states require it to have, uh, to be free of a lien. Some states don't care. Some states don't have this at all, but you should be aware that these things do exist. And I'll give you a list of the states that, that have these sorts of things. This is kind of a neat uh, probate proofing tool uh, for someone who owns a car. Uh, uh, Virginia requires there be no liens uh, and it must be in your name only. But if you, if you put this on your vehicle, it doesn't change title. It costs about 10 bucks to do this. But if you die, your uh, beneficiary just uh, takes the title down to the uh, DMV and, and they, they, have, they have a car uh, just like that. Uh, got 120 days in Virginia to do that. So be aware that, that you can do these transfer on deaths for motor vehicles. That's kind of cool. Uh, you can also do real property in some states, okay? Uh, Virginia is one of them, and I'll give you a list of the ones. And again, very, very state-specific stuff, uh, but kind of cool to know. This on real property is basically a beneficiary designation for a piece of real property. And it can be solely titled. It can be jointly titled. Um, I've written transfer on death deeds that say, uh, for couples that say, on the death of the last of us, we would like it to go to our kids. It does not change title. These cost about 30 bucks to record in land records. Um, they're revocable and they don't change title till you're dead. And then once you're dead, your beneficiary owns a house and it's all outside of probate. It's kind of cool. So another little trick in the toolbox, okay? Um, I won't give you all that stuff. Y'all can read that. Okay, states with statutes, here they are, the ones that I know of still, uh, they're, just, they're evolving. Uh, uh, I will tell you that the clerk of the probate court does not like these and they don't like them because it hurts their revenue. Uh, and there have been a lot of complaining in Virginia about them by the clerks of the courts because they've seen their revenue drop because of them. I mean, why not? Why would you let a house go through probate when for, you know, the cost of having it drafted, which is usually fairly nominal and the recording fee, uh, you've avoided probate. So here's cars and real property, real property only and cars only. Um, they all vary greatly. Once again, you need to know uh, what your state does, but, but here's a, a, a good, I believe, current list, okay? It does change occasionally. 
Okay, we've already talked a little bit about these. Uh, beneficiary designations and beneficiary transfers are all governed by state or federal law. Uh, you should check your own designations and have your clients check theirs too. Uh, I have EO, EOPF is, is my uh, federal government uh, employee, employee file. Uh, I had a big surprise a few years ago um, when I was uh, living with a domestic partner. Um, I, I had everything uh, changed over to her as my beneficiary. My mother had died. Uh, there was no one else to, to get it. So everything was going to her. I did a bunch of beneficiary designations, including like my federal life insurance, uh, my last paycheck, you know, all those forms you fill out for uh, to get death benefits. All that stuff was, was her. Um, and then when we got married, I went back and said, well, I should probably update these because now we're married. And lo and behold, all those beneficiary designations I did never got to my official personnel file. I don't know where they went but they never got to my personnel file. So, so literally years went by with my mother who was deceased as the beneficiary on all this stuff. That would have been a giant mess. And that was on me because I just thought that they were done and filed and posted and they hadn't been. So good lesson learned there uh, to periodically or even as you do these yourself or your clients do them, to go back and make sure that they were actually done. Uh, you don't need those kinds of surprises. Uh, but here's a list of the kinds of things that, that typically um, you can put beneficiary transfers on. Um, the only time a court's gonna get involved in these is if the person you have left something to is themselves incapacitated and then it's going through a guardianship of some sort. If your beneficiary has died before you did, like my mother, that would have been a problem. Uh, if you make the beneficiary my estate, you better have a good reason to do that. And you may, uh, a lawyer may advise you to do my estate because you maybe you have taxes that need to be paid or there's something you know unusual about your estate that's going to require some cash in the estate itself in order to handle something. Uh, but and so there, there are occasions when that's something you would do, but typically no. Uh, if you, a lot of people just get lazy and they put my estate on there and all that means is my estate and probate. So you filled out a beneficiary. Mary, I think we lost you for a minute. Do you want to try muting and then am I back muting? online? Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? We can. Somebody post in chat, please. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about inter vivos trusts uh, and how they work, because uh, you should know these. Um, they, ah, sorry guys, hold on. Uh, they are a probate avoidance technique for most people's purposes, okay? So let's talk about inter vivos trusts, also known as the living trust. Uh, there are two kinds. Uh, there's the revocable, which is what most people do. And by revocable, I mean that you can move assets in and out of this trust. You can sell them and buy them and in the name of the trust at will. Uh, they remain part of your taxable estate as far as the IRS is concerned, okay? Uh, there's also something called irrevocable. Uh, we don't see those too much anymore, uh, mostly because it is designed to give up control of an enormous amount of money uh, to get it out of your taxable estate. So, you know, if you won the lottery for $400 million, you would probably want to consider an irrevocable trust. Uh, you may get the income off of that trust. You typically cannot get um, much of the principal. Uh, you don't own that asset anymore, per se. You will, um, you won't be able to control it. I mean, sometimes you'll hear people talk about blind trusts. Uh, what that means is, 
there's a whole lot of money sitting around for your benefit, but you don't get to decide how it gets invested. Because if you have control over it, the IRS says, oh, no, no, then it's not out of your estate. Uh, and that could be a huge tax problem for your estate. But for most people you're going to be dealing with, they're going to be talking about a revocable trust. Right? Um, if you're not worried about getting money out of your taxable estate, you're just using a revocable, um, it's really a probate avoidance technique. And, and it works like this. So uh, people ask me all the time, well, do I need a, do I need a living trust or not? Well, I don't know. Uh, so I own a house in my own name in Maryland. Um, Maryland does not have transfer on death deeds. And I would like my house to go to my brother but I don't want it to go through probate. I don't want to put my family through probate for this house. So how, how am I going to get that to him? Well, I could jointly title it with right of survivorship, right? That's one way to do it. Recorded deed and land records, uh, making him the joint owner with right of survivorship. So if I die, uh, he gets the house at my death. I mean, he's the automatic owner. That works. Um, there are some perils in that. Uh, and they sound a lot like this. Um, he's a nice guy right now, but what if he turns out not to be a nice guy later? Or if he gets in financial trouble and now the IRS has a lien on my house or he gets divorced and now his soon to be ex-wife would like a piece of my house because his name is on it. Or he just decides he needs money and he goes to court and forces the sale of the house, which he could do. Um, he moves in because it's his house too. A lot of brother drama uh, that comes with this joint titling thing. The other problem is once I put him on there, I can't take him off without his consent. That's a problem too. So the joint titling thing, a little risky. So what's my solution? I don't have a TOD deed. The joint titling sounds scary. Um, the only thing I can do is go to town, hire a lawyer, and have the Mary Benzinger Living Trust drafted. It's gonna be a great big fat thing, uh, a whole lot of pages and a whole lot of stuff. But when you boil it down, what it says is that this is the Mary Benzinger Living Trust. I am my own trustee during my lifetime. Uh, I can buy and sell assets in the name of the trust. It will. At my death, I nominate my sister Betty to be my substitute trustee. So, what do I do once I sign this great big document? Once I sign this trust, uh, hopefully with the help of my lawyer, I will uh, have a, a deed drafted. And the deed, deed will sell my house from me, Mary Benzinger, to the Mary Benzinger Living Trust. And I will record that deed in land records, just like a sale. Uh, and so when I die, my house is no longer an orphan because the trust owns it. Got it? And now you can do that for all kinds of assets. You can do it for houses and cars and bank accounts. And you can even within the context of your trust, say the contents of my house, I hereby give to my living trust. So when you die, if you've done this right, uh, your car and your house and your assets and your beneficiary designations are all to your trust. Everything goes into your trust. And then what you do is in your trust, you leave instructions for distribution. So my trust will say, Betty, upon my death, I direct you to sell my house and give the proceeds to my brother, John. And so I've achieved mission. Um, uh, I've avoided brother drama and I have gotten my brother the proceeds of this house outside of probate. So it's kind of a slick trick. The person who asked the question, oh, wow, what do you do if you got a whole bunch of different states? Well, uh, here's, a, here's kind of a, uh, a common problem. Uh, single soldier with uh, five houses in five different states because everywhere they've ever been stationed, they're busy buying houses. Well, that's great until they die and they're all probate assets. And so now you have a uh, sort of like a master probate where they are a resident of, and then you'll have all these other ancillary probates in every state where they own a house. So name someone you really don't like as your executor and get even uh, be because they're gonna be hating life uh, doing probates all over the country. 
that's a that's a classic example of someone who needs a living trust. Uh, if all those houses are titled in the name of the trust, uh, then at your death, um, your trustee just runs around and starts selling houses in five different states instead of probating them. Uh, there is a good caveat in the in the notes here um, that. Um, before anybody does a living trust and 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 transfers the house to the trust, you usually have to get permission of your mortgage company. Uh, they often will want to see, uh, you know, what the deed looks like before the deed gets recorded. Because uh, I think I, I had a, a friend who did one with Chase, and Chase wanted to see uh the draft of the deed before the deed was recorded transferring it to living trust they wanted to make sure it was clear that the the liability didn't change on the mortgage and they had specific language they wanted in there um and um and you know it was a, a little bit tedious but it was just a, a small amount of paperwork they really wanted to see just to make sure that everybody was clear that this did not get the individual off of liability for the paying the mortgage. Uh, so anytime you do something like this, uh, where, where you're actually changing the title and, uh, and you have to be careful too of transferring title. Like I said, you know, do I want to put my brother John on my house? Uh, you better ask your mortgage company first. When I got married, I owned a house. I wanted to put my spouse on there with me. I had to get permission of Chase to do that. They wanted to see the deed before it was, was recorded and that there was an acknowledgement yes i still have the money uh, they had some very specific things they wanted in the deed so if you have a mortgage anytime you're messing with title uh you better run it by your mortgage company first um let's see there's a couple questions here in the in the chat do, do. Uh, we talked about the the, the making sure the 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 mortgage company is, is down with the plan. You want to do that. Does Brother John pay taxes on that? Uh, whether John pays taxes on the, the inheritance or not, because it's treated as an inheritance, uh, whether he pays taxes on that or not depends on the state. There are some states that have inheritance taxes, uh, which are paid by the heir. There are very few of them. But most of them, my recollection is, if he is a blood, a close blood relative, he will not pay any inheritance taxes. Uh, inheritance taxes are typically paid on, on non-relatives. So if you leave uh, your house to your paper boy or the kid that mows the lawn, who's no relation to you, uh, that kid may be paying an inheritance tax depending on, on what state you are in, okay? Um, uh, real estate in different states, the houses are placed in different LLCs. Um, well, the, the LLC, um, I mean, the question is who owns the LLC at death? Uh, I, if no one owns the LLC, LLC is basically, think of it like in, in terms of like corporate shares. Uh, if those shares are orphaned at your death, that's going to be a probate. That LLC and everything it owns is now a probate asset. Um, I, th I think you can build a succession plan in an LLC. Um, I haven't seen that done in a long time, but I think you can probably do it. Uh, but the LLC, it, it can itself, is, is, is an asset, it, and it can be an orphan at your death. So it, it may be going through probate and everything that comes with it, uh, everything it owns. Is it difficult to create a trust? It's not difficult, but it can be expensive. It depends on what state you're in and what lawyers are. I mean, up here in the Washington metropolitan area, it's thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, in more remote places, it's probably more like 1500 or two. Um, it can be expensive, but if you got five houses in five different states, it's worth every penny. Because uh, the, 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 the cost of probate, the time consumption of probate, um, somebody, remember somebody has to pay the mortgage while that thing's going through probate. Who's gonna do that? Uh, you know, so there's, there, there's, there's uh, the time value of money here. Uh, it's probably well worth the expense if, if you have lots of assets that are going through probate. Um, so uh, bank accounts, you, you can you, you can just put the beneficiary, you know, the Mary Benzinger Living Trust dated September 8, 1995 as your beneficiary, excuse me, and, um, and the trust is just going to get that. Um, 
Uh, let's see. Some was a car collector, had a trust that stated automobiles under personal property in the trust, but didn't list the automobiles. Titles were not title enough. Did the cars have to go through probate? Um, I, 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 okay. So if, if an, if an asset has an actual title, like a house, like a car, uh, that title has to be the trust. If the title is John Doe and he dies, now that's an orphan. I don't think, I, I don't think you're going to be able to avoid probate just by saying all my automobiles, because those have actual titles. Okay. If it's like your sofa and, and your 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 mother's china, uh, those don't those don't aren't capable of titling. So if you just say you know the contents of my house belong to my living trust, the contents of the house belong to living trust. Uh, they, they don't have title, but if it has title, I think you have to title them. Okay. Um, uh, best place to find resources laws for our specific state. Um, uh, kind of the cheap and easy way, and this is not an army endorsement or anything like that, is good old Google, um, and and websites like um, what's that one like Nolo N O N O L O uh, dot com, and uh, there's a bunch of things you can Google to find like what what your what your specific state may say about uh, beneficiary designations and stuff like that, and and whether they have um, transfer on deaths and things like that. There's just, you know, good old Google. You can't beat it. Um, next question on here is if someone's a car collector, had a trust that stated automobiles. Okay, we did that one. Um, California, 2019, DAS revocable trust costs 3,500. Uh, yeah, so it, it, it varies a lot. Um, oh, someone just put up NOLO on there. Huh? Oh, great minds think alike. Okay. Um, so that's the living, uh, that's the living trust. Uh, back, back, back. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This is slow and then it's fast. And someone's question was, what about funding the trust? Which is my next slide. <laughs> Again, great minds that you like here. Trusts have to be funded to work. Um, probably about once a year, somebody comes in and says, hey, my dad died. Uh, I'm the trustee of his living trust. What do I do? Like okay, um, um, well, well, what is a trust own? Well, what do you mean? Well, I mean like who owns his house? Who's on the deed to his house? Well, well he is. Um, who's on the title to his car? Uh, he is. Uh, who's on the title to bank accounts? He is. Are any of your father's assets titled to the name of the trust? No. Well, then use the thing to light the furnace because that's all it's worth. The whole purpose of this thing is you don't just sign it and stick it on a shelf and forget about it. You have to fund the trust, which means the trust only works for assets the trust actually owns. Okay, Retitling, a must. It only avoids probate for assets the trust actually owns. Again, it avoids ancillary probate, uh, like we talked about the soldier who owns five houses in five different states. Um, but you got to fund them. Um, an, another side advantage to the, the trust is if you do uh, fund the trust properly, uh, this is more private than a probated will. Probate is public. Anybody, including your troublemaker nephew, can go down to the courthouse once you're dead and pull up whatever list of assets my brother may have uh, uh, filed with the court. It's public. It's not private. It's public, completely public. You can go down to the Fairfax County Courthouse in Virginia and look up George Washington's will, and they'll show you a copy. Okay? Uh, it is all public. Now, if you have a litigious uh, family, uh, they're going to go down there and say, wow, you know, Aunt Mary died with like a million bucks. I, I wonder if I can get a piece of that thing. And for 65 bucks, they can start a fight. So if you have that kind of thing, uh, one of the th things InterVivos trusts to do, it is nobody's business what is in that trust and what is owned by it except the beneficiaries of the trust. So if you want to keep out some meddlesome family members, this is one way to do it. Uh, the other advantage to uh, living trusts 
are most of them will have uh, uh, continued management of of trust assets uh, during your in, excuse me during your incompetence or um, incapacity. Uh, sometimes a power of attorney is going to be enough, depending on what your assets are. But you know, it's it's it it, it does have that advantage. Uh, you still have to have a will. Uh, it's it's not good enough to drop a trust and walk away. You still need to have something called a pour over will. It's usually a very straightforward little document. It's not very long, a couple of paragraphs. Um, and typically the estate planner who does your living trust will do one for you. And basically it says, whoops, if I have any uh, uh, probate assets that I forgot to title in the, in, the, in the living trust, please give them to the living trust to be distributed. Um, it's a catch-all drawer, okay? Um, okay, so uh, Barbara O'Neill put something up and said, um, uh, we did everything possible to avoid probate on mom's estate, living trust, sold the car, but still ended up in probate for probated final pension and, and social security payments for the final partial month of her life. Uh, probate costs more than the money received. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that, that can be true. Um, because Social Security um, uh, sometimes sends a check direct to the heirs. Sometimes they put it right into the bank account. Uh, if the bank account was the, the money went into was owned by the living trust, that probably wouldn't be a problem. Uh, but sometimes you get a check in the mail from somebody. And, and, and this happened with my, my mother-in-law. She got a check in the mail for like 1100 bucks from, I can't even remember what it was for. Uh, but, you know, we had to go, go do a little probate thingy doodle because, you know, we had to do a, an affidavit, small asset uh, affidavit for probate because of this 1100 bucks. Uh, so, uh, you know, avoidance of probate, uh, uh, not an exact science, uh, unfortunately, but but you can sure uh, uh, get a lot of it out. Unfortunately, there, there it does happen um, that, that these things ha that these things do pop up. And, and the other thing I've seen happen is. Um, it, for example, I think this was uh, someone was killed in an automobile accident um, by a drunk driver and got a, uh, an insurance settlement uh, post-mortem, and that was a probate asset because uh, there was no other way to do it. Um, okay, so something I posted about the tax exemption. Um, Yeah, I have no idea what they're going to do. Um, your guess is really as good as mine. Um, if they lower the exemption to five million, then more people are going to be paying, you know, are going are to be in the ballpark for having to pay some estate taxes or do some actual planning. Um, and um, uh, elimination of step up basis at death. Okay, the step up basis at death uh, is kind of a good deal. Uh, let's talk about that for just a second. And I'm not a tax attorney, so don't grill me too hard on this. Uh, but if you um, if your mom dies and has left you a house, uh, your uh, basis for tax purposes is date is date of your mother's death, not the date she bought. Not, that's not what it was worth when she bought it in 1960. Uh, so so that's the advantage of inheritance. Um, I was not aware they were trying to get rid of that. That doesn't surprise me. Uh, that's been on the books a long time, um, but we'll see whether that, how, well, whether that actually gets through. I mean, the the bottom line is one of the one of the triggers for this estate tax stuff is it's it it everybody complains about it when they when they raise these these uh, amounts or lower these amounts, but it is a staggeringly low number of states who actually pay taxes. Uh, mostly because, you know, if you got 11 million bucks, uh, hopefully you have the good sense to go hire an estate planner who's going to give you uh, some kind of estate package that's going to avoid most of those taxes. It's, I think it's like less than 1% uh, we're actually paying these taxes. So it's a very, very, very small number. Um, it, it's, it's, sort of, so it's sort of easy mark to, to, to throw these out there and say, see, we're making rich people pay more. The bottom line is rich people are going to figure out who to hire to make sure they're not paying this. Uh, one more question here. Let's see. Can a person place assets in trust to avoid back tax responsibilities? Uh, no. 
um, the the IRS is uh, first of all, if, if if it's a living trust, um, you that is not free from the IRS. Uh, the the IR, that that is still controlled by you, and the IRS still says that's part of your taxable estate. If you put it in a in a revo an irrevocable living trust, the IRS will probably come back and say that's some kind of fraud, uh, and they would find a way to unwind that. So you know they're they're not really going to let you uh, get away with that. Uh, there's one more down here uh, uh, for 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 Barbara. Um, uh, hang on a second, it's jumping around on me a little bit here. Um, okay, that was more a comment. Um, when and how is a living trust terminated? Um, uh, the answer to that is it depends. Um, most people's living trusts um, will, will terminate. All right. Let's go back a little bit. So a revocable living trust is revocable during your lifetime, which means you can buy and sell assets at will. At, at your death, those terms become irrevocable. You have to live with what's what's already in there and what the disposition is. So if I put my house in there and I die, my sister Betty must then do whatever that trust says to do with the house, sell it and give the proceeds to my brother, John. Uh, once she has liquidated all those trust assets, the trust dissolves. There's nothing left in the trust, and nor can she put more in there. Um, it, it completely, it completely, um, um, there's no more trust assets. So, so basically the, the, the trust effectively dissolves at that point. Um, Let's see. Uh, uh, the the comment above about you know Wells Fargo messing up. Um, I, again, the the other reason you should be um, double checking, triple checking, making absolutely sure without question that all your stuff is right. Um, trusting others to do it uh, always bad. Okay, so um, uh, the Secure Act, IRS, and the ten-year rule. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by a ten-year rule. Um, oh, oh, oh! You mean for the withdrawal stuff? Okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. It, it took me a second to to get that. Um, so right now, I think. Um, your beneficiary has to take it all out within 10, 10 years. Um, I mean, that kind of is what it is. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's my recollection. It's, it's off the top of my head here, guys. So don't, don't particularly quote me on this, but my recollection is that it's, um, it's not all beneficiaries. It's only some of them. And I and I don't remember exactly which ones are which um, that that have a ten year withdrawal limit or requirement. Um, and I, I honest to goodness don't don't remember. Uh, I, I just don't know. Uh, but there 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 is for some people for some beneficiaries a ten year requirement. Um, uh, hang on, guys. I'm catching up with the chat here. Okay, non-spousal beneficiaries posted. Yes, yeah. Okay, so I, it's I, I knew it was some kind of there was a limitation on on who who you could do that with. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, if you're a non-spouse beneficiary, if I leave it to my brother, uh, then they've got a, they've got ten years to withdraw it. It you know it is what it is. It's better not getting it at all. Um, all right, gang, let's move on here. Uh, any other questions on on trust before we kick off to Will's? Everybody good? I hope I've answered everything. If not, we can come back around in the end. Uh, okay, Will's. Uh, uh, what are they? Uh, uh, you know, they're they're 
most of you have probably seen them. Uh, typically, they are comprised of some kind of uh, distribution of real estate, of personal property, maybe specific bequests, um, and the residuary estate. So literally, you're sorry, guys, I'm having trouble making this work. Apologize. Um, So the typical will is going to say, you know, I leave all my real estate to my sister Betty. I leave all my personal property wherever situated owned by me at the time of my death to my brother John. Uh, I want my pocket watch to go to my nephew. Um, um, and then the rest residue and remainder of my estate shall be divided amongst my surviving uh, siblings in equal shares. And it's kind of a typical uh, will distribution. Now, uh, be careful of specific bequests. Uh, it, it is it is very common to see um, clients come in with an Excel spreadsheet of I don't know ten or fifteen names of small amounts of money they want to leave to people. Five hundred bucks to the paper boy, two thousand dollars to my nephew, uh, and they want those included in the will. Uh, it is a problem uh, sometimes uh, because specific bequests have to be paid out of probate assets. So what happens if you don't have any probate assets? Well, the answer is the specific bequests don't get paid. So if I have a, a, a million dollar life insurance policy and I make my mother my beneficiary, uh, my life insurance policy. So if I die, you know, she gets a polite letter and a check for a million bucks. And that's the only asset I really have. And in my will, I leave my brother specifically $750,000. Um, I make sure he gets a copy of that. Uh, and that guarantees my nieces and nephews send me birthday cards on time every year. But when I die, how much is he going to get? The answer is zero, because I have no probate assets. If there isn't seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar probate worth of probate assets, he gets nothing. So that laundry list of specific bequests has to be paid out of somewhere, and if there's no probate asset, they're just not getting it. So I often have people say, "Okay, look, who do you really want to have stuff? Yeah, you can carve out a chunk of life insurance to do it. Um, maybe you know your checking account, put a bunch of pay on deaths on there." Um, whatever you'd like to do, but the, the laundry list in the will is, is probably not a good idea if you have no probate assets and you're serious about people actually getting these, uh, these amounts of money. Um, uh, established trust for minors, uh, and we'll talk about trust for minors in a minute. Uh, tax planning trusts, which aren't very common anymore because of the level, at least in my business, because of the level of, of the uh, tax uh, levels, appointing your fiduciaries, we talked about them. Uh, preference on funeral arrangements, I will put that in a will for you, but by the time they find your will, they have done something else with you. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about better ways to do that. Uh, let's spend a little bit of time on on, on kids and then we need to move on. Uh, poor planning and minor children is really an issue. If you leave uh, money to a child by name uh, and, and a, a minor child by name, uh, so everything to my spouse, if my spouse doesn't survive me, then, then to my daughter, Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth is eight. Uh, SGLI is not going to pay Elizabeth. They are going to hold that money until an adult qualifies as her guardian in court or until she turns 18. Um, this is a problem. Um, it can sit there. Uh, the only problem with guardians, well, a couple of problems with guardianships. Number one, uh, courts tend to be cheap with how much money they will allow to be spent from, from a guardianship account. Uh, and they just give it to your kid at 18 and they don't care what your kid is like. So this is this could be a problem too. Uh, if, if someone has special needs kids, I mean, real special needs kids, kids who are likely to have to be on Medicaid when they grow up, um, they need some special planning. And they should be talking to estate planners who understand Medicaid rules because Medicaid rules are state by state. Okay, um, so um, uh, that's that's something to flag for you. Uh, please never ever designate an adult caregiver as a beneficiary. Uh, everything to my spouse. If my spouse survives me, if my spouse doesn't survive me, then to my mother Betty. Um, well. 
and I have minor children. So my wife dies and my mother, Betty, gets all the money. Uh, could be a lot. Um, she has no responsibility and no requirement to use it for my kids. It's her money. Um, she can run off with the pool boy to Cancun. She can buy a new house with it. Uh, she has zero responsibility for uh, taking care of my children. That's a bad idea. And we've seen that happen many, many times with soldiers. It's just terrible, especially leaving money to step parents, uh, expecting them to take care of your kid from a previous relationship. That always goes poorly. So one of the solutions is a trust for minors in your will. They're called a testamentary trust because they are in your last will and testament. Uh, and I do them all the time. Uh, everything to my spouse, if my spouse survives me, if my spouse does not survive me, then entrust for my kids until my youngest turns 21, whatever you want to do. Uh, but these are touchy little thing here. There you go, testamentary trusts. Uh, they're also called contingent. They're contingent upon you being dead. Uh, and sometimes you and your spouse both being dead. Okay. Uh, but they're for minor kids. Um, ah, so there's a, web, a webinar coming up on special needs trust. Uh, tune into that. Uh, the nice thing is you get to control when and how the money gets distributed in this trust. Um, you can do separate trusts for each kid. Uh, you can do single trusts. You can do uh, a pot trust for everybody. You get to pick what distribution time. Um, and typically the trustee just pays health, education, maintenance and welfare for the kid until um, you until the money runs out or until the kids age up and they distribute. Okay. okay. So anything you might spend on your kid if you were alive, that's what your trustee is going to do. Health, education, maintenance and welfare. Uh, typically, if it's a single family plan, mom, dad, kid, bio kid of both, uh, or, you know, two parents, bio kid, um, everything to my spouse, if my spouse survives me, if not, then trust for our kids. Uh, people do have to make sure that after they sign their will, they change their beneficiary designation. So on my SGLI, it's no longer to my spouse. And then my mother, Betty, bad. It's no longer my spouse. And then my kids by name, guardianship. It's going to be my spouse and then something to the effect of to my trustee for the trust established under my last will and testament. That way, if my spouse predeceases me, uh, the money's going in trust for my kids. If you have a blended family, you have a little bit different problem, right? Um, the first to die may get left out in the cold. So if I leave everything to my spouse and I leave a five-year-old from my previous relationship, again, she has no responsibility whatsoever to take care of my kid. Uh, this can be a problem. Uh, people don't think these things through, and these can be sensitive topics. What do, you, what do you mean you don't trust me to take care of your kid from a previous relationship when you die? It's not that I don't trust you. It's that I kind of don't trust you. Um, but the, the, the spot issue is, look, uh, uh, again, don't leave money to your mother, Betty, to take care of your kids. If you're going to take care of your kids, do it yourself. Um, make sure you, that you set this up in a way that the person – uh, that the, the kids are taken care of and, and it doesn't rely on anybody uh, but but the trustee itself. So you can do prenup agreements where you can get rid of the elective share that the other spouse could claim in court and all that stuff like that. Uh, it, that stuff's all complicated. The easiest thing to do is a pre-residuary trust. Uh, and remember we said the residuary was uh, everything to my spouse and then to my kids in trust. There's actually a pre-residuary trust. It, it's pre-residuary because it's literally located physically on the document above the residuary trust. And it will say something like, uh, if I leave any assets to this trust uh, under Article 5th, uh, I direct that they be held for my children, uh, uh, Sally and Mary, uh, who are from my prior relationship. Uh, and and uh, to be distributed, uh, held for them until the youngest is 21. Uh, it doesn't require the death of my spouse. This one's effective on my death. So I'm taking care of my kids independent of my spouse because they're my kids from a previous. And so I, my SGLI, it's going to say maybe something like 75% of my, my SGLI is going to my Article 5th on there will I'll ask will and testament for my kids from my prior marriage. And 25% goes to my current spouse. There's the distinction, okay? Pre-residuary takes care of the kids right now. Um, uh, 
but uh, someone put up here, uh, not to everyone, just a question to host and panel. Service member still needs to contact a lawyer to create a trust, correct? I think some service members don't understand there's an additional step. Um, in legal assistance, we do trust for minors inside the will. So testamentary trust, everything to my spouse. If my spouse doesn't survive me, then to my kids in trust. We do that in legal assistance. Um, and we also instruct them once they sign their will, okay, now you have to go back and change your beneficiary designations on like SGLI. So everything to my spouse and then in, into the trustee for the trust under my last will and testament, we walk them through all of that. So we are available in legal assistance to do that. Um, So uh, funding trust, again, we've already talked about that. You can do it with current assets. You can do it with life insurance, but you got to do it. Um, tax issues, we kind of covered all this already. Um, uh, federal estate tax, it, it may be changing. We've talked about that a little bit, but that's where it is right now. It's indexed annually. Here's, here's the states with inheritance taxes, and here's the states where, where there are estate taxes, for your knowledge. Uh, yeah, fiduciaries. Boy, this thing's touchy. I'm sorry. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about fiduciaries, your FIDOs. Uh, this is not an honor, and it's a whole lot of work. So please select people carefully. Um, one of the things we've had to do is rewrite people's wills like the next week because they went and asked their brother if they'd be the guardian of the kids, and their brother said no. So uh, ask, ask first. <laughs> Talk to your family and say, hey, you know, will you be my guardian of my kids? Uh, and the answer may be no. Uh, consider institutional trustees. Um, institutional trustees can be a blessing, like a big bank, Bank of America, USAA, one of these banks with like big trust departments, uh, because you you got to be careful personalities. Uh, if you're, uh, if I if I set up a trust for my kids and um, uh, from a previous relationship, and I make my current spouse the trustee and my current spouse and my ex hate each other and don't get along at all, why would you set that up that way? Uh, or if you have a contentious family, someone who's gonna be screaming at the trustee all the time, um, you know, they don't scream at Mrs. Smith at the bank as much as they might to someone who's, who's non-authoritarian uh, like that. Um, beware of co-fiduciaries. People want it, that, well, I want my sister and my brother to make the decision together. I once had a little old lady tell me, I'm going to name both my boys as my co-executor. They haven't spoken in 20 years, and this will make them talk to each other. Yeah, that's going to go over, right? That's going to work. Um, so I don't recommend co-anything. Uh, the whole purpose of this is to, um, is to have someone make a decision, right? Um, and again, make sure they know. A question in, in, the, in the chat, can I have the Senate Retirement Services on Fort Hood? Uh, it's certainly worth asking Fort Hood if if they're if they're legal assistance attorneys at, at retirement services. I don't know, but if you have a retiree ID card, you can go to legal assistance anywhere. Um, you got to call down to Fort Hood Legal Assistance and see and see what they're what they're if they have any limitations on on uh, doing things for retirees. I doubt they would. They're a pretty big outfit, so I'm sure they have plenty of lawyers. If you got to award a lawyer, how much does it cost? I have no idea. Um, it will vary incredibly by state, okay? Um, I mean, there are some states where it costs a couple hundred bucks. There's some states where it costs a couple thousand. I, I, I can't even begin to venture a guess. But please talk to your, if you have a, if you, you're an ID card carrying retiree, military retiree, um, you should be asking. Um, all right, it's stuck again, hold on. Okay, let's let's get away from the wills for a second. Let's talk about some powers of attorney. Keep this thing moving. Uh, there's a bunch of different kinds. Um, you you appoint an agent, someone to do something for you. Uh, there's the general power of attorney, which most of you have probably seen. That lets you know last for about a year, drafted by legal assistance. Lets your spouse, for example, do all kinds of stuff while you're deployed. Uh, special powers of attorney are just that. They're for a special purpose, like selling a car. Um, the ones for incapacity planning that you typically see are both something called springing and durable. They will spring into effect on your incapacity and they will survive your incapacity. Now, the caveat is I think Florida has made springing powers of attorney verboten. They are, they are not done anymore. Um, that is not necessarily true for military uh, testamentary instrument powers of attorney in Florida, but beware that Florida has kind of backed away from the springing. 
Well, they might have an expiration date on them, but one thing you have to know is that they all die with you. I have people tell me all the time, I will do a power of attorney uh, so my brother can do stuff after I'm dead. No, 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 can't do that. Uh, these die with you. Uh, what can your agent do? Pretty much anything that that document says they can, okay? Uh, some of these are very, very broad powers of attorney. So, you know, be careful who you give them to. Uh, what can't they do? Uh, typically, they can't change pay on death beneficiaries unless they have a specific directive in the power of attorney to do that. Uh, and they typically can't make health care decisions for you, again, unless there's a specific directive in the power of attorney to do that. Uh, end of life decisions. Um, you got to talk to each other. And this, this is hard. OK. Um, uh, tell your family and please be consistent. I've had people say, well, I've told my mother, I, I, it's okay if I'm kept alive forever, but I told my sister unplug me. Oh, wow. Don't do that. Uh, consistency is the watchword of the day here. Um, uh, you know, sit around the campfire with a glass of Merlot and talk about what you want. Uh, my mother was a little old lady and every 10th phone call, she'd say, you know, I want to be buried in the blue casket with the light lining next to Aunt Eva, right? Yes, Ma, I know. But the good news is I did know. And so when she died, she got what she wanted, except she changed her mind about what she wanted, but she still got what she wanted. Uh, advanced medical directives. Uh, some states are kind of phasing these out. I think California has gotten away from these. Um, uh, these are kind of your wish list on what you want to have happen to you if you're near end of life. This doesn't appoint anyone to do anything for you. It's just kind of a statement about what you want. Uh, it can be a little confusing if it conflicts with your power of attorney. So we're, we're kind of getting away from these a little bit. Um, but the healthcare power of attorney is, it, it, it kind of rock and rolls. Um, you are giving your agent the authority to make healthcare decisions for you if you cannot do it yourself, consistent with your known desires. So again, it's really important to talk to family members about what you want and what you expect. Uh, if you have one of these in place, place no one has to go get a guardianship for you uh, and there's no there's it, it, these are these are drama reducing okay again springing uh, only effective on your incapacity and survive your incapacity we've talked about that um, do you need one yeah you probably ought to uh, for for medical powers of attorney uh, most states have a hierarchy this is virginia's uh, the guardian of the patient the spouse except if you filed for divorce <laughs> that's kind of a good idea not to have your soon-to-be ex make your life decisions uh, adult children parents brothers or sisters uh, any other relative in in, in descending order uh, so that's the statutory one if you don't have a document itself the problem is uh, this page here so if two or more people listed in some of those classes above like all your siblings for example um, if they can't agree, it's majority rules. Just imagine that. Uh, talk about your fist fight in the hallway in the hospital. Uh, you have uh, a bunch of siblings who can't agree. Wow, this is going to be fun. So again, this is why you have these documents. Um, it, it, it eliminates the, the these kinds of issues. It cuts down on the drama. You don't have fist fights in the hallway. Uh, they can get mad if they want to, but ultimately you have someone who you trust to make your decisions with a piece of paper in their hand. Um, it doesn't have to be someone on that list I gave you. Um, uh, you can appoint someone else. Uh, your domestic partner is a typical one, your best friend. Um, it can be a non-relative. It can be whoever you want. Uh, someone posted here in the chat, John, Colorado, the language used for end of life directions must conform to state specific law. They'll be ineffective. Uh, the state-specific removes your ability to tailor the end-of-life decisions to your own desires. You take what the state allows or not. Um, well, well, while that may be so, um, some of these are, are vague enough um, that say things like, um, I, I, I give my permission, and I don't know Colorado specifically, you know, I give my permission to withhold uh, uh, food and water if, you know, in, in, and basically it's in the discretion of your agent. So while they have some some statutory forms they prefer to use that become familiar to to uh, healthcare providers, you, you, there's still some wiggle room in here. And most of these, the way they're written, and like I said, I don't know Colorado specific, specifically. Um, that this is kind of an art rather than a science. Um, if you've ever had to do this for anyone, 
uh, you will know that. Uh, it, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. Everyone, everyone's end, life ends differently. And your agent needs to kind of go with the flow and understand what you wanted and use that as their guide to make decisions for you. Um, the, the grab and go book, um, I can't take credit for this. When my 85 year old mother moved in with me, um, she fell about two weeks after she moved in and, and, and wound up having to call 911. And they showed up and they said, so uh, what kind of medication is your mother on? Uh, uh, I don't know, a lot. Um, that wasn't the right answer. And I'm running all over the house looking for pill bottles. Uh, where's your mother's uh, insurance card and drive? driver's license. Well, that was at the bottom of an old lady purse, uh, rumpled Kleenexes and, and plastic rain bonnets and four rosaries later. Uh, the Fairfax County Department on Aging suggested a grab and go book, a medical grab and go book. Here's the recipe. You can expand on that anytime you want. I think everyone from birth to death ought to have this and have it not only on the shelf, but, but scanned into their phone. Believe me, if you ever, ever have to call 911 and you have this on your shelf, you will thank me. Um, Agents for Disposition of Remains, uh, DD-93 for soldiers. Uh, there are, uh, you can actually have a disposition of remains if you're a civilian. Many states authorize that. Who gets to bury you? Again, another huge fist fight. Uh, so if you're gonna have family who say, no, I want you at the home place. No, I think you should go back to, to, to be buried with your sister. You know, have a disposition of remains in place. Those control, uh, oops, a document care and storage, uh, someplace safe. Uh, make sure you tell people where they are. Uh, I've had people, you know, want to bury them in the coffee can in the backyard. Uh, don't do that. Uh, don't write on them or mutilate them. Uh, years ago, my all law partner had a little old lady who said, as you can see, I've cut my nieces and nephews out of my will, and she had snipped out their names with a pair of scissors. So cathartic though that may be, uh, that is not how you amend your will. Uh, so don't write on them, don't change them. Uh, an estate grab and go book is a good idea. Uh, there's the recipe. I'm not going to bore you with it. Uh, but again, you know, for soldiers who are used to making I love me books, uh, this is kind of an estate I love me book. Uh, if I'm dead, please do this. The first page in mine says, if I'm dead, please send a death certificate to all these financial institutions and my POC at work. Uh, because, you know, my sister doesn't know where I bank and she won't know unless I tell her. Okay, so final thoughts to wrap this up. Uh, remember we said it was continuous? Well, it is. Um, every time you uh, buy a new house or sell a house or move or uh, get a new kid or your kids grow up or you get divorced or you get married, uh, continue stuff. Get a new bank account. Make sure you put a power, make sure you put a beneficiary designation on there. Uh, so continuous, continuous, always got to be in the back of your head. Planning as a family is a really good idea. Um, it, you have to talk to each other. You have to discuss blended family issues. Uh, some of these can be sensitive. I mean, you know. I've seen people that put their hands over the ears and start going, la, 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 I don't want to talk about you being dead. Well, we have to talk about me being dead because uh, it's going to happen someday, whether I like it or not, and whether you like it or not. So, so plan as a family, and this is continuous. You always ought to be thinking, is my estate plan current? Again, the other nice thing about the grab and go book is it's on your shelf and you can pick it up and think about it once in a while and say, oh my goodness, I made my sister Betty my executor. What was I thinking? Uh, but that's the kind of thing you, you need to be thinking all the time about your plan. All right, well, that wraps me up, folks. Um, I can stick around for questions. I know that the, the folks probably need, uh, there's some slides afterwards you all need to go through. So I will back off right now and um, let turn this back over to, um, I'm not sure who's taking over. Hi, Mary, thank but, you so much yeah, for a wonderful. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. We do have a couple minutes for questions. So if anybody has that, if you want to put that in the chat before we wrap up today. I have given up. Marty, I'm not sure if you're talking, uh, but I do think you're muted. So I had asked if anyone had questions. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay.
All right, I am, this is Selena. I'm not seeing any more questions come in. Oh, Mary, everyone is just thanking you so much for an amazing presentation. And I so appreciate all of y'all and your questions. Um, thank you so much, Mary, to all of you who contributed to the conversation in the chat. I do want to go ahead and invite you to the next event I'm being held by our military caregiving team, which is Social Security and Disability 101. That webinar is Wednesday, July 27th at 11 a.m., so it's coming up soon. Um, Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, provides critical financial need to help aged, blind, and disabled people who have limited income and resources. In this webinar, participants are provided important information about the basics of the SSDI and SSI programs, as well as the application process. In addition, the next personal finance team webinar, Thrift Savings Plan Updates for 2022, is being held August 16th at 11 a.m. Equip yourself with comprehensive knowledge of the latest thrift savings plan changes. There have been considerable changes recently, so we've got the latest for you there. This free webinar ensures that military counselors and financial educators are able to answer general questions from TSP participants and gain a collection of resources to provide clients with further information. CE credit is available for both upcoming webinars, both the Social Security and Disability webinar and the TSP webinar. If you are interested in CEUs, our current session is approved for one and a half CEU credits for AFCs, CPFCs, social workers, case managers, and board certified patient advocates. We also offer a certificate of attendance. Please click on the link for the evaluation on the event page through the purple continuing education button. You can see an example of that on the slide here. While completing the evaluation, we would sincerely appreciate specific suggestions for future webinar topics that could be used directly in your work with service members. At the end of the evaluation, you'll choose the correct link for your accreditation, then you'll be directed to a 15-question post-test. Once you pass the post-test with 80% or higher, you'll receive a certificate of completion by email. Please make sure to click all the way through to the end to receive your certificate. If you have any questions, please email me directly at oneoppersonalfinance at gmail.com. I also want to invite you to subscribe to our monthly newsletter that comes out on the first of each month. It shares upcoming webinars so that you can get those events on your calendar, as well as an article related to timely financial issues. We would also love for you to join us on Twitter at oneoppf. And now I will turn things back over to my colleague, Coral Owen. Thanks so much, Selena. I wanted to echo Selena's thanks to Mary for another phenomenal session. It's always so nice to have you presenting with us. And thanks again to everyone who contributed in the chat pod today for conversation and questions. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I just saw a question regarding the continued education. So just to reiterate, um, please visit the event page for today's webinar. The slides that we went through today are also available on the event page. Uh, so follow that continue education button uh, for all of the opportunities that are available for continued education credits. Um, Leah, I'm seeing your question, a link for the chat for phone use. I apologize. Um, okay. Gotcha, gotcha, glad that that is taken care of. Um, all right, so we are almost at the bottom of the hour, so we're going to stay on for just another minute or so longer uh, before we close things out. Again, thanks to Mary and to the personal finance team for hosting today's session. We hope to see you again uh, at thanks, our everybody. upcoming events. Thanks, Mary, um, and we wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. And again, if you have any questions once we wrap today and conclude, please don't hesitate to reach out to Selena at the one op personal finance email address that you see on your screen. So thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon.